am live. I am reading The Laird and the Lady. It's a novel by Joan Marshall Grant, who used to write books about her previous incarnations. This is fiction, and it is. Um, it was published in 1949, and it is the story of a laird and a lady who meet in a French chateau, and they are now in the highlands of Scotland, where Rowan, the laird, has his castle and lives there with his grandmother Georgina. The castle and uh, estate is called Cloud. We are now uh, at chapter 10 of the second part, and it is entitled The Croquet Lawn, or Croquet Lawn. Marilda felt an increasing sympathy with Emily. She decided that it was more than probable that the stories about her were inspired by jealousy and that she had run away with, with Gaston only because the Frenchman had taken the trouble to be kind to her. The Italian garden was further evidence in Emily's favour for a vulgarian would not have conceived the thickets of rhododendron and azaleas, chosen the flowering trees, planted the lilium aratium, and so made of the natural amphitheatre a retreat which seemed to belong to a more genial climate. A stream flowed down over a series of waterfalls beside shallow stone steps. At each level there would be drifts of flowers in spring, narcissus and daffodils, polyanthus and scarlet anemones. Marilda was sure of this, even before she identified them by the leaves. She was equally unsurprised to find that there were lily of the valley and Solomon's seal clustered thickly under a crag that was half covered by winter jasmine. She sent for nurserymen's catalogues and made lists of further shrubs to be ordered as soon as she found a way of telling Rowan that she could afford to employ as many gardeners as they needed. The broken fountain that had known three centuries of sun in Italy would be brought to life. If only Emily was not so unpopular, that could have been done now, for all that was needed was to replace the section of the lead pipe which used to bring water to it from a spring higher on the hillside. After spending a pleasant morning there in Angela's company, she decided to return to the house through the beech wood, which as yet she had not thoroughly explored. The dog ran ahead tunnelling through the drifted leaves in pursuit of imaginary rabbits. Marilda ran after her, laughing with the exhilaration of going too fast downhill, until she had to clutch at a low branch to prevent herself falling over a sudden drop which had been invisible from above. The bank had been cut away to form the back of a small pavilion, its lattices, its lattice falling into decay and a roof overgrown with ivy. In front of it, there was a bench and two chairs beside a round table, rustic ironwork that had once been painted white. She glanced at her watch. It was earlier than she thought. No need to go back to the house yet, and it would be pleasant to be lazy in the sun. She sat in one of the chairs and wondered idly if they were another relic of Emily. Perhaps Emily used to play croquet here. Croquet here. Croquet here. <laughs> Wearing the same clothes that she had found yesterday. Could this have been a croquet lawn? Try to imagine what Emily would have seen. The picture formed without any sense of effort. All she had to do was to pretend to be Emily. The white hoops were brilliant against green turf. A man in a red and yellow blazer was taking careful aim with his mallet. She heard the click of the blue ball hitting the striped post. A girl got up from a chair on the far side of the lawn and walked briskly to the black ball that was lying close to the third hoop. Why will Georgina never learn to walk gracefully, she thought with a touch of annoyance. Probably her corsets are laced too tight, which is why she looks so flushed. She's wearing the skirt I gave her, and she was too proud to let Julia alter it. The poor shy child insists on pretending our waists are the same size. It's really quite pathetic. I've done my best to help her, but what can one do when she behaves like a tomboy? I told her husband times... I told her a husband time... I told her a hundred times, sorry. 
that men do not like masculine women, yet she refuses to take the hint. She sighed. Really, at times it is difficult to be patient. Even Hector is becoming rather a bore. One could hardly recognize him as the same man who was so attentive on his honeymoon. How I wish I could persuade him to spend the winter abroad. Father offered to take a villa at Cannes for us so it wouldn't cost anything. And why shouldn't I spend my own money instead of having to use it here? I wonder if Drummond has remembered that I ordered iced coffee instead of tea. He ought to be glad not to have to carry the kettle out here, but he will probably deliberately pretend to have misunderstood my orders. Hector won't hear a word against Drummond. How tiresome those, these family retainers can be. Thank goodness Julie and Gaston realize that they are my servants. Even Hector had to admit that a lady's maid and a chauffeur have to be French. As soon as I can get rid of the cook without unpleasantness, I shall insist on a chef. Angela, her hackers up, thrust a cold nose into Marilda's hand. Darling, how you startled me. What's the matter? The dog, whimpering with fear, ran a few paces up the hill and then slunk back to her mistress. We'll go away if you're frightened. But there's nothing here. Look, not even a rabbit on the lawn. Now, that's very odd. I could have sworn there was a lawn down there, but it's only rough grass. She rubbed her hand across her eyes. I suppose I was daydreaming. But was there ever a crooked lawn down there? I must ask Rummin. We could use we could turn it into a tennis court. Then she suddenly hugged the dog close to her for comfort. Angela, I don't blame you for being frightened. I'm frightened too, but I'm not going to admit it to anyone, not even to myself. This time I didn't just put on Emily's clothes. In some way I don't understand. I put on herself. She stood up and lit a cigarette. But Angela, we are not going to think about it. We are going to be very ordinary, feet on the ground people. To prove it, I shall show Janet this afternoon that she has not been very clever to presume I can't play golf. She found consolation in the thought of Janet's discomfiture. It would not be entirely easy playing with borrowed clubs, but even when out of practice, the winner of the state championship, at the age of 19, should not find it beyond her powers to put Janet, whose handicap was 11, into a better perspective. She found the others drinking sherry on the terrace. Where have you been, darling? inquired Rowan. I thought we might have lunched at the golf club, but I couldn't find you. I wanted to find out if it would be easy to mend the fountain in the Italian garden. I traced the pipe down from the source and then grabbed about until I found where it's broken. There's a section of the lead missing, as though it had been cut through with an axe. She saw the look on Georgina's face. Oh, why did I say that? It was cut on purpose, and Georgina did it. She hated Hector's wife so much that she couldn't spare even her fountain. I expect one of the men wanted a bit of pipe for something else, and remembered there was a free supply there said Rowan easily. The fountain hasn't worked since I can remember. Probably got frosted and no one could be bothered to mend it. No doubt it can be put in order if Marilda wishes, said Georgina gruffly, though it seems a waste of money when there are so many more urgent repairs required. <coughs> oh, thank you, she acclaimed impulsively, but it doesn't matter. I only thought it would seem more alive. Oh dear, I've said the wrong thing again, of course. She doesn't want anything belonging to the other woman to be alive. Have some sherry, said Georgina. At least the cellar hasn't yet ran dry yet, though most of the bins need drinking. I found the Chateau Leoville 98 was running through the cork. Had to send eight dozen to the hospital, save it going to waste. Old Drummond must have turned in his grave, said Rowan. I think having to hand out the best port to the tenants at Christmas was the real cause of his stroke. Whiskey for the men and port for the women is the rule, he added to Marilda, and it's a test for the hardest head, for you have to take a nip at each croft. Marilda pretended to appear attentive to what he was saying, while she tried to bring back the association that Drummond had brought almost into focus. Drummond, how did she know 
that he had been very tall, very unbending, that he limped slightly. It's going to be hot on the golf course this afternoon, said Duncan. Sure you wouldn't rather come over to Daloch and play tennis? No, said Janet quickly. She wasn't going to lose the opportunity to, of seeing Rowan's wife at a disadvantage and Marilda claimed to be fairly adequate at tennis, which was probably a deliberate understatement. And anyway, she looked far too attractive in shorts. Let's have a tennis court here, said Marilda, where the croquet lawn used to be. You're confusing Cloud with somewhere else, darling. We've never had a croquet lawn, croquet lawn said Rowan. Oh yes, we did, said Georgina. She seems to know the place better than I do. It was in the hollow below the Reachwood. Quite right. Croquet used to be very popular in Cloud when she hesitated, when I was young. Darling, you must have looked enchanting in a straw voter, swinging your little mallet, said Rowan lightly. Marilda felt a sudden need to protect Georgina from mockery. Of course she did. The old woman smiled. It's very kind of you to say so, my dear. I always felt rather foolish when I tried to be elegant, but one still tried until it was no longer necessary. That was the end of chapter 10, and uh, the chapter 11 is entitled The Glorious Twelfth. The, the Glorious Twelfth. 